Uh, today, I'm really delighted to have uh, now Emeritus Professor Eric Legius with us, who is one of the pioneers, I would say, in terms of uh, care and research in NF. And uh, <clears throat> this masterclass was supposed to be held in conjunction with Ellen Denayer, who apologizes for not being here today, but Eric will be um, <clears throat> covering all the subjects on his own. Um, uh, just uh, a little detail regarding the Q&A. Uh, uh, Eric will be giving the lecture now, and uh, you will be you, you, you can put your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box, and I will be moderating the Q&A uh, after the lecture. Uh, you will, unfortunately, you won't be uh, it won't be possible for you to interact directly uh, with with Eric, but uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll be in the middle. <laughs> And um, with that said, uh, thank you, Eric, for joining us today to talk about uh, the rarity in the rarity, which is uh, rare tumors in NF1. And the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Eric Legius, as you can see here, and I'm an emeritus professor at the Center for Human Genetics in the University of Leuven. Today, I want to uh, go with you over a number of rather rare tumors in individuals with neurofibromatosis type 1. And here on this slide, I give a list of the tumors that I will um, deal with. So first, we start with the dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor of the brain, then we'll go over the bone tumors, the giant cell lesions of the jaw and the non-ossifying fibromas. Then we will continue with the abdominal tumors to go to the glomus tumors of the digits, and then say a couple of words about cutaneous malignant melanoma. So the first one is uh, the dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. This is a rare tumor, <clears throat> but if we go to this um, <clears throat> sorry, review about epilepsy and NF1, it is shown here that from 621 patients with NF1 and epilepsy, a total of nine turned out to have a dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. If you do the opposite and you look at all the individuals with a dysplastic neuroepithelial tumor, dysembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor, you will find um, a large number, a large percentage of individuals who in fact have neurofibromatosis type 1. So this is an example of one of my patients here where you see in the temporal region, a growing mass uh, here and there. So it was in the region of the hippocampus and it was associated with a, a therapy resistant epilepsy. So the only thing that could be done was to do surgery. So uh, many individuals with NF1 who have intractable epilepsy and go to surgery um, have this, this embryoplastic um, neuroepithelial tumor. This is a, um, a recent analysis of uh, the genome of this embryoplastic neuroepithelial tumors, and this consists of all kinds of different origins, not only NF1, but as you can see here from uh, this list of tumors, there were three of the tumors that showed an NF1 mutation, and in one of those three, it was a uh, germline mutation. Also, variants in FGF receptor 1, FGF receptor 2, uh, NF1, PDGF receptor alpha, BRAF um, are all uh, reported and points towards the uh, RAS MAP kinase system as being important in the uh, pathogenesis of these disorders. Also, PIC3CA. Um, uh, is important. So also the um, PI3 kinase pathway is involved. And also PTPN11 here in, in one case. Giant cell granuloma of the jaw. Now we come into the bone tumors. These are giant cell lesions. Um, it's not really a granuloma. And it are bone lesions with giant cells. But it, it is not the giant cell that is the initiating the initiating uh, cell. It are the, the stromal cells within these giant cell lesions that are the initiating uh, cells. There are benign lesions, 
They usually appear in the second to third decade, more frequently in the mandible compared to the maxilla, and they can be solitary or multiple. Here I show you a case uh, that I have seen myself, and this case had both a uh, maxillary lesion and a mandibulary lesion. Here you can see the maxillary lesion as an expansive growing uh, tumor here in the upper jaw. And here you better see the lesion in the lower jaw that is expansively growing and is destroying the bone in the region. Here we could, um, it was uh, removed, the lesion was removed and it was filled with bone uh, grafts. And we could culture the cells and analyze the NF1 mutation and we found the second hit. We found the same second hit in the upper and in the lower jaw. The patient also has on the same side uh, more abnormalities uh, of the skin, of the brain, of the hair, and so on. So here we hypothesize that it is an early second hit, an early hit in the embryonic development of the uh, cranial neural crest that is responsible uh, for all these lesions. Uh, but it shows you that these are, uh, are the, the stromal cells in these lesions have the second hit in the NF1 gene, not the giant cells. They are secondarily recruited. And this is an, another uh, patient that um, we studied together with uh, the group from uh, Hamburg with Vic Mauder and uh, Reiner Friedrich. And it's a multi rocular mandibular giant cell granuloma, but in fact, it's not a granuloma. And the giant cell is not the primary initiating cell, but also here they were uh, able to send us some tissue. And in that tissue, we were able to find a second hit in the NF1 gene, but in the stromal cells, not in the uh, giant cells. Then the next bone tumor is the non ossifying fibroma. These are also benign bone lesions, usually in the second decade of life, uh, more frequently in the lower extremities and around the knees. They're usually asymptomatic and you pick them up if you do an X-ray because of unequal neck length or whatever. They um, usually regress spontaneously after puberty, but sometimes they are associated with a fracture after a minor trauma. And um, it is the combination of non-ossifying fibromas in combination with cafe spots and other features of neurofibromatosis type 1 has been reported in the literature as Jaffe Campanacci syndrome. Um, but in fact, if you look very careful, um, it are, most of these cases have a proven uh, NF1 mutation. Not all of them, but most of them have uh, a proven NF1 mutation. As you can see here in the left uh, image, you see the expansile growing uh, non ossifying fibroma with a little uh, pathological fracture due to a minor trauma. Usually these uh, cysts undergo curettage, uh, are filled with uh, bone grafts and then are stabilized here with an external fix with an with a fixator, but that's not always uh, necessary. And here you see afterwards that it healed completely. So most of the time they are asymptomatic. They don't need any treatment, and they regress spontaneously. And only in very rare cases um, you need to do surgery if there is a pathological fracture due to a minor trauma. But this is the exception. And abdominal tumors, um, here I refer to a nice review paper from uh, 2012, where they list all the gastrointestinal manifestations of neurofibromatosis type 1. And of course, you have the neurogenic neoplasms. Um, you can have the neoplasms from the interstitial cells of Cajal. And these are uh, clinically relevant gastrointestinal stromal tumors or like incidental 
very small gastrointestinal stromal tumors, which can be seen when a part of the intestine is removed. It can be seen under the microscope or directly by eye, but are very small. And then under the microscope, it is frequently associated with uh, hyperplasia of the interstitial, interstitial cells of Cajal. And then you have the neuroendocrine tumors, um, which are less frequent in NF1 uh, compared to the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So first we will deal with the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. They frequently affect the small bowel, which is in um, contrary to the gastrointestinal stromal tumors you see in a general non-NF1 populations, they usually affect the stomach. But in NF1, it's usually the small bowel. So the duodenum, uh, ileum, eunum, these are CKIT positive stromal uh, uh, spinal shaped uh, tumors. So the cells are spinal shaped. At least 5% of NF1 individuals will show this tumor uh, sometime during their uh, life. And as potential symptoms, it could be an abdominal mass, it could be pain um, or bleeding with bloodstained stools or vomiting of blood. And it could be really um, catastrophic. So it could be very severe bleeding with people who end up in the, uh, sorry, people who end up in the uh, emergency room um, because of a, a hemorrhagic shock because they have lost so much blood. And then, of course, if it's a chronic problem, the fatigue can be fatigued due to anemia. It is recommended to remove the symptomatic tumors surgically or if they are detected incidentally and to remove them if they are larger than two centimeters in diameter. So here you see a, a large gastrointestinal stromal tumor. They do not grow in the epithelium, but they grow in the uh, wall of the uh, intestine. So they are um, mesenchymal tumors in the wall of the intestine, not in the epithelial layer, but they grow into the lumen. Uh, the epithelium is uh, uh, removed by um, all kinds of uh, food that passes by and it can lead to a massive bleeding. And on the right side, you see the uh, spinal shaped cells. And if you stain them um, with um, an antibody against a uh, kit, you will see here in the middle image that they, this tumor, which is under the epithelium, um, stains all the cells they stain with, uh, with kit. And if you look at the epithelium itself here on the right side, you see a couple of cells that stain with, uh, with the antibody against C-kit. And these are the mast cells that are normally present in the epithelial layer of uh, the intestine. And that serves as a control for your staining. Uh, more than 15 years ago, we have been working on these gastrointestinal stromal tumors because at that moment it became clear that they were more frequent in individuals with NF1 than in the general population. And together with the group of Ludwin Messiaen and here in Leuven, the group of uh, Maria Denbiech Richter, we were able to analyze um, in three different individuals with NF1, a total of seven uh, gastrointestinal stromal tumors. Those that uh, arise in non-NF1 individuals, so the sporadic non-NF1 associated gastrointestinal tumors, they frequently have a mutation in the KIT receptor itself, a dominant activating mutation in this tyrosine kinase receptor, which activates the receptor and then results in an activation of the MAP kinase pathway, the AXTAT pathway, and the PI3 kinase pathway. Um, so it's most of the time a KIT mutation or a PDGF receptor alpha. KIT and PDGF receptor alpha, they belong to the same group of uh, tyrosine kinase uh, membrane receptors and are very close and very similar to each other. As you can see here in table one, we did not find any of these two mutations in the seven 
tumors that we analyzed, but in every tumor, uh, except for one here, uh, a second hit in the NF1 gene was identified, showing that loss of the um, normal, the wild type NF1 allele is the cause of the growth of these tumors. And also it was shown that by looking at the NF1 gene and the second hit, that they really belong to the tumor spectrum of individuals with NF1. Um, in table three, it is shown that many of these of these, these tumors, they contain copy number gains and losses very similar to what you see in the sporadic tumors. So aside from the NF1 loss uh, of the wild type copy, we also need to have some copy number gains and losses, like one P loss is very frequent, that then uh, stimulates the cells to um, grow further. In general, these tumors have a better prognosis than in uh, sporadic cases, uh, but they have the potential to metastasize. Uh, when we go to the latest uh, recommendations for uh, surveillance and treatment of uh, tumors in individuals with NF1, it is um, strongly recommended to resect lesions that are larger than two centimeter or lesions that are symptomatic. Here is um, a case of um, uh, of my patients, where you can see a whole body MRI with the blue arrow pointing towards this lesion here uh, in the abdomen, which you can also see on the two uh, axial uh, images in the middle and on the right side. And this was a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. It was in the uh, wall of the of the uh, of the duodenum and it was removed by, by surgery. Uh, if you detect them incidentally, um, they can usually be removed by laparoscopic surgery with very, very few morbidity for the individual. This is a study uh, from Japan uh, from a couple of years ago, um, from 2016, where they looked at um, 95 adult NF1 patients, and they were screened by CT scan, and they found a gastrointestinal stromal tumor in six of them, meaning that in their series, about 6.3% 6 of the individuals in a cross-sectional study um, turned out to have a gastrointestinal stromal tumor. This is another study uh, from uh, Finland, about intestinal tumors in NF1, with a special reference to fatal gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And this is from the group of Juha Peltonen. They have done a population study and they have a Finnish uh, uh, care register for healthcare um, with 1,410 NF1 individuals. And in these, um, they found that the highest hazard rate I was observed for tumors in the small intestine. And when they looked at the NF1 death certificates, uh, just demonstrated that it was the primary cause in seven individuals. So also here in, in Finland, they had several patients that died because of a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, which can be picked up when it's asymptomatic by a whole body MRI. Uh, at this moment, it is not recommended in the uh, guidelines from the ERN, the U European Reference Network, Gen Tourist, to actively screen for it. But if you see that in Finland and also we experienced uh, an individual who died because of massive bleeding um, by gastrointestinal stromal tumor, you might consider uh, doing this. This is another study where they looked at abdominal tumors in individuals with neurofibromatosis uh, type 1. And they ended up with 43 adult NF1 patients that were followed at the dermato dermatological department of the Department of Dermatology of that hospital. 
and in eight or in six individuals, they detected eight abdominal tumors. Um, so which is quite high um, if you refer to the 43 NF1 uh, adult patients. When we look more into detail from these six individuals, there were uh, four who in fact had a gastrointestinal strong tumor. So there's a little less than 10%. Uh, uh, three had a pheochromocytoma, and there was one with a, who also had a periampillary somatostatin producing tumor, which is quite rare. Now, this brings us to the neuroendocrine tumors, um, with at the first place the pheochromocytoma, and at the second place the gastrointestinal carcinoid tumors. Um, and within the carcinoid tumors, the um, uh, gastrointestinal neuroendocrine tumors, the periampillary somatostatin producing endocrine tumor, the somatostatinoma, somatostatinoma is uh, the most frequent in NF1. Um, gastrinomas and insulinomas are really not uh, frequent in NF1. In the general population, Periampillary somatostatin producing endocrine tumors are seen in less than 1% of those individuals who have a functional uh, neuroendocrine neoplasia of the gastrointestinal system. It is estimated that uh, only one per 40 million individuals per year in a general population will develop uh, such a somatostatinoma. And there is a strong association with NF1. If you go through the series of somatostatinoma, you will see that uh, many of them uh, are associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. However, the true incidence in NF1 individuals is not known yet. But I also have uh, one or two individuals during my career that were diagnosed with this kind of tumor, uh, which is quite rare. And it can metastasize, just as the gastrointestinal stromal tumors can metastasize. It's also possible for the uh, periampillary somatostatin producing endocrine tumors. The combination of a pheochromocytoma and a uh, uh, gastrointestinal carcinoid tumor is also seen uh, in multiple endocrine neoplasia and in von Pippel-Lindau syndrome. It is not. Uh, limited to neurofibromatosis type 1. So this is um, an immunohistochemistry uh, on the tumor that was removed in from the duodenum and it showed the strong staining for a somatostatin. Now, pheochromocytomas are more frequent in uh, NF1. It's a tumor of the medulla of the adrenal glands. And you see here on the right side, you see the kidney. Um, and above the kidney, where the arrow points, there is a, a round tumor, which, is, uh, which was a pheochromocytoma. It is associated with an increased secretion of catecholamines, um, which can provoke symptoms. But in, in my experience, uh, most uh, secreting pheochromocytoma that I have uh, diagnosed in, in, in adults with NF1 uh, were not associated with symptoms. But after removal of the tumor, most of the patients said that they felt much better. Um, that the, after removal of the tumor, they were again feeling uh, like years and years ago, and they were more calm, they were not that uh, uh, nervous, and uh, they had less tension. But when I asked up front, they would never say that they had any symptoms like headache, palpitations, or sweating, which are the typical symptoms associated with NF1. It is extremely rare in patients with NF1. Um, and you don't want to wait until they have all these symptoms before you diagnose it. Hypertension is very difficult because I never found it associated. Um, um, and maybe you have to do 24 hour um, registrations or so, but 
in, in, in my experience, hypertension is not associated. So most of these that I have diagnosed had no symptoms and were incidental findings on MRI. They all had uh, increased excretion of catecholamines and uh, metanephrines in the, in the urine. Um, and it is recommended to screen for pheochromocytomas in pregnancy because during the process of labor, due to the increased abdominal uh, pressure, the adrenal gland is uh, really um, like uh, squeezed like a lemon and all the um, catecholamines are released in the blood during labor, which can be dangerous. It can be treated by surgical uh, resection. Um, and as you can see here, also routine biochemical screening is not recommended, except for women who are contemplating pregnancy or who are, who are already pregnant. It is also advocated to screen for uh, a pheochromocytoma in case a person needs an abdominal uh, uh, surgery because then if they somehow touch the adrenal gland, it might provoke severe um, cardiovascular uh, complications. A cortical sparing adrenalectomy should be preferred if possible due to the risk of a metachromous contralateral adrenal tumor. And I, one of my patients uh, had a bilateral adrenalectomy um, because it was uh, not possible to have the cortical spare and adrenalectomy. And then they, of course, need a complete substitution for uh, corticosteroids. This is a, a study from France, from Patrick Combemal, who looked at 156 adult patients and they diagnosed 12 pheochromocytoma, of which six were secreting. So that's about a little less than 4%. And this is um, over a period of one year. So this is a cross-sectional uh, study of 156 patients. So this is quite high to identify um, virtually 4% of individuals with um, with a pheochromocytoma in a cross-sectional study. When we look at our retrospective study of 276 adults and adolescents um, that we screened uh, with whole body MRI uh, and also by history taking clinical examination and so on, with a medium follow-up of nearly five years, we identified 11 secretory pheochromocytomas, which is also around four, nearly 4%, four which is very close to the study of Patrick Combemal in, uh, in Paris, or in France, sorry. Um, we also identified in this group six GISTs, so four that were um, detected by the whole body MRI. Uh, one was retrospectively diagnosed on the whole body MRI, but was missed at the time the whole body MRI was taken, and one was detected after the whole body MRI three years later, and then we went back to the whole body MRI, and it was not seen on that whole body MRI. So this is 2.2% in our series uh, of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. But as you can see, um, if you detect ANUPS, so the atypical neurofibromas in our series at an average age of 30, the pheochromocytomas at an average age of 39, and the gist at an average age of 53. So with increasing age, you have a higher uh, frequency, first of pheochromocytoma, and secondly, of gastrointestinal stromal tumors. So I think it depends a lot on the age distribution in your patient population, how much pheochromocytomas and gastrointestinal stromal tumors that you will uh, detect. Then, of course, we go to one of my favorite topics, which is the glomus tumor of the digits. Um, uh, the glomus organ is an organ that is localized in the um, distal phalanx of the digits. And it is a neuromyoarterial structure here. 
and it's in fact a anastomosis between uh, an arteriole and a venule. And it's a thermoregulatory organ uh, that can shunt the blood um, and prevent it from flowing through the fingertips uh, when it's cold in the winter and then it opens in the summer when it's hot of course the shunt closes and the blood is forced to flow through the fingertips so that it uh, can help cool down the body if if you have a glomus tumor of of the uh, digits we usually see that it causes pain pain which is provoked sometimes by cold so it's a cold intolerance and it's a very localized tenderness so if you go with a very small instrument and you probe the fingertip there is only like one specific point that provokes pain so it's a localized tenderness and it's very cold sensitive i had one of my patients who worked in a restaurant and when he had to go and get some additional uh, food into the walk-in fridge, he would first take a bucket, fill it up with warm water or hot water and put it outside of the walk-in fridge. And as soon as he came out from the uh, walk-in fridge with all his cold food, he would put his hand with the glomus tumor immediately into the hot water to, to relieve uh, the pain. Uh, because then, of course, the blood is shunted away from the glomus tumor and is not forced to flow through uh, the glomus tumor, which can be extremely painful. Usually, it is this triad of pain, localized tenderness, and cold intolerance, and you don't see anything at all at the tip of the finger, which makes that it, it takes sometimes many many years before a diagnosis is made because there is nothing to see at the fingertip uh, it's only painful um, no x-rays no ultrasonography no mri shows anything and the patient has a lot of pain and then they start looking at the whole nerve going from the neck uh, to the arm and the hand there is nothing to see so it takes sometimes many many years before a diagnosis is made in sporadic non-NF1 patients, a glomus tumor of the digit is a solitary tumor. But in NF1 individuals, we see that it is frequently multifocal, affecting more than one finger at the same time or um, over time in the same individual. Um, this is a uh, picture where the localized tenderness was uh, located in the first individual that we diagnosed. Um, and this is uh, a publication from 2002 with our hand surgeon, um, Professor De Smet. And here you can see this glomus-like organ with all the glomus cells. These are, in fact, um, smooth muscle uh, containing cells here um, with, with different lacunae where you can have uh, where the blood flows. Then of course, we once we, we have had seen one case and I knew what the uh, symptomatology was, I started to diagnose more and more cases, uh, which gave the opportunity for Hilde Brems, who was then uh, uh, it's the student in my lab to study these tumors that were uh, prepared by um, Luc de Smet, our uh, hand surgeon. They were removed under local anesthesia. And she could show that the um, smooth muscle actin positive cells uh, contain the second hit in the NF1 gene, not the swan cells that you can grow from that lesion. So it's not a swan cell tumor, but this, this is a... Uh, it's a um, uh, kind of a fibroblast-like uh, cell that has a lot of smooth muscle, alpha smooth muscle actin. Then there is this uh, nice summary um, by Doug Stewart on the diagnosis, management, and complication of glomus tumors of the digits from 2010, which is still um, a very nice uh, 
review paper that describes all, all the different things. If you wait long enough, sometimes you see this red or bluish hue uh, at the position where you have the localized tenderness. Here you can actually see the tumor um, because of it is associated with the swelling with a blue hue and also a dystrophy of the nail. So it's sitting in the nail bed, pushes on the nail and is extremely painful. Here you also can have the impression that you see some little swelling here at this position. And here also it was associated with the splitting of the nail. But of course here, this is um, not as far as it was there. So this is at the beginning and this is at at a very advanced stage. And in fact, uh, there should not be any NF1 patient who presents uh, in this stage anymore. Now that we know um, that it exists, that it is part of the NF1 tumor spectrum, and that it is relatively easy to recognize and to treat under uh, local anesthesia. You do not need to show it on MRI if you have a good hand surgeon because it is relatively uh, simple to diagnose clinically. And we never do in our center um, MRI of the hand. The uh, hand surgeon just clinically examines the patient and then um, organizes a surgical intervention, the local anesthesia, and always manages to remove a, a glomus tumor. This is a summary. You can see here, this was a combination of patients that we had seen in Hamburg, Germany, in Leuven, and in NIH, um, and most are females. This is from the previously reported uh, number of cases. Most are females. Uh, and as you can see here, it's uh, the fourth finger is the third, and the fourth fingers are the ones that are mostly affected. And uh, several of them had a multifocal tumors, um, while it is not seen in a general population where you have uh, the same kind of tumor, but then it's an isolated case. As you can see here, years of symptoms before diagnosis, it can be really very long before a diagnosis is made because it's not very well known that it is associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. So when I see an adult patient, I will always ask for pain in the fingertips. And during clinical examination, I uh, examine the fingertips and I put a little pressure on the fingertips uh, as a way of, of of uh, trying to provoke symptoms and uh, find the glomus tumors. Um, and every year there are one, two or three individuals with such a tumor um, who have surgery. Then I want to say a little bit about malignant melanoma. Um, so the first publication um, on, on this topic was again uh, a publication from the French group with Pierre Wolkenstein. Um, and they, they looked at a at melanoma incidence in patients with NF1. And they said, well, we, we, we do think there is an increased melanoma incidence, but we are not completely sure because our series is relatively small. Um, and they found uh, more females and a higher thickness than expected and a frequent association with a second neoplasia. Um, but they were not completely sure if this was uh, real or not. Then there is a publication here of the group of Finland, where they did a population study, is the group of Juha and Circo Peltonum. When you look at melanoma of the skin, um, which is also uh, indexed, um, and you, you see there is like the expected 1.9 and they observed three. So they did not have sufficient power to find an increased uh, number because the numbers are too small. Now, a more recent study uh, from last year in JAMA Dermatology, they did a retrospective cohort study and they included 4,122 patients with NF1. Um, 
of which about a little bit more than half were women. Um, and they found an odds ratio of 2.27 for um, melanoma of the skin. So they suggested that there might be an increased risk of melanoma, although it is small. Um, so it was a large national database, um, which was uh, uh, used uh, with rare genetic disorders and skin cancers. Um, it's limited to patients with the commercial insurance that were available. Um, so there were a number of potential uh, biases and also the fact that NF1 patients may come, uh, may seem more frequently by dermatologists might increase the chances of them being diagnosed with skin cancer. Um, and the relative risk is relatively small um, and the absolute risk um, is not that high, and it might and they say it might not be clinically meaningful, and it's probably not relevant to change screening recommendations at this moment. Uh, and then here, this is another very recent from this year, um, also from the United States, where they uh, again look at. Um, at studies that have been published, they looked at 53 papers um, with 188 NF1 patients, um, of which 82 had um, melanoma. Um, and they compared it with the general population, and they ended up with the uh, odds of 2.55. So there are now recently two studies one is a retrospective cohort studies the other one is a population is a study uh, from everything that has been reported in the literature um, and they both suggest that there might be a uh, slightly increased risk for uh, melanoma in nf1 individuals i don't think uh, at this moment that it uh, is warranted to uh, change any uh, screening. Um, we just have to be, uh, just have pay attention to it. It is known that in sporadic melanoma, there is a, a high frequency of individual, of uh, sorry, of uh, somatic mutations in the melanoma cells itself. In the NF1 gene, it's the third most frequently mutated gene in sporadic melanoma. It's also associated with desmoplastic melanoma, so with a specific form of melanoma. Um, but as is frequently seen in individuals with a, a germline mutation in the NF1 gene, um, there is might be a slightly increased risk for melanoma. Um, and it's not that severe as you would expect based on the fact that it is so frequent seen as a somatic mutation in uh, melanoma. So by this, uh, we have come at the end of my uh, presentation. I want to thank the people from my uh, research group here and all the other external collaborators. And I want to thank you for your attention. Marco, you're still muted. Yes, thank you and apologies. Thank you, Eric, for this very thorough overview of the uh, of the rare tumors in NF1. Uh, we have questions coming up in, in the chat box. The first one is from Amadeo Azizi. He is wondering if you've ever seen children with glomus tumors of the fingers. Yes, I've seen uh, a child with a glomus tumor of the, of, the, of the little finger. And it was so painful that when the child came in, as a child with NF1 came into my office, it, she would help her one hand in the other, close to her body, um, with a face that said to me, you're not going to touch my little finger. Uh, so it was so painful. Um, it was also enlarged. Um, but in, in children, it is relatively rare. So I've seen it in one child. 
Uh, but I don't think it is relevant to systematically screen young children uh, for a potential or our children in general for a potential glomus tumor. We also have in our studies uh, a case from Hamburg who had the glomus tumor of a toe, but that is rather exceptional. Well, thank you. Uh, there's a very interesting question coming from Ignacio Blanco, who wonders if you've ever seen a familial aggregation of uncommon tumors, and if you think a pers you know, a surveillance of these families should be should be done. Um, I have not seen it for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, uh, but I have seen a clustering of pheochromocytomas in, in one of the families that I'm following with, I think, four relatives from the same family affected with the pheochromocytoma. And in this specific family, uh, their NF1 germline pathogenic variant is a missense variant. So there might be a genotype-phenotype correlation in this specific family, or it is possible that specific variants predispose to pheochromocytoma. We know that this is the case in von Hippolino syndrome, where missense variants have a much higher risk for pheochromocytoma than those with a truncating variant. Uh, at this moment, we don't know if this is the case for um, for pheochromocytomas. But that's my personal experience. I have not found anything uh, in the literature on, on this. So I, I would be very interested if someone has more data on this. Uh, it's a very interesting question. Uh, we have a question coming from a patient, which I'm going to, to, to give to you. Is it common to have multiple plexiform tumors over the body? Um, uh, the patient laments that she had one in her right pinky, causing issues with cold and pain numbers, pins and needles. Yes, that is... If it's in the pink and if it's at the end, say in, in, in the tip of the little finger, and if it's uh, sensitive to cold, then it should be... She should, uh, the patient should contact uh, a hand surgeon because the chances are quite high that this is, uh, this is potentially a glomus tumor. On the other hand, it's also common to see multiple plexiform tumors over the body that is not exceptional. We see that more often, yeah. Um... A question again from, thank you, um, Eric. A question again from Gianluca Piccolo. Uh, regarding non-ossifying fibromas, do you confirm there's no need for further surveillance after occasional detection during adolescence? Um, should, should we tell patients that are at a higher risk of factor and therefore pay more attention during sports? No, no, because the, the risk of fracture is very low. I have seen it maybe two times in 35 years or so. Um, so I don't think there is a need to actively screen for this. Um, one has to bear in mind that um, if there is this uh, fracture due to minor trauma and an X-ray is taken, um, that you might diagnose at that moment a non-ossifying fibroma, which should then be removed by curettage and uh, the, uh, the cavity should be filled with uh, with bone grafts, uh, and that cures uh, the problem. Um, I don't think we have to screen for it, first of all. And secondly, when you see it incidentally, I don't think we have to reframe um, the, the children from sports. Um, I, I don't think because in most cases it will it will never provoke any any problem. But thank you for for clarifying this. I see no other questions in the chat, so I may come up with a question myself. <laughs> and I wondered if, uh, when you were talking about the giant cell granulomas, 
Uh, I wondered what what the what the effect on the quality of life of the patients typically is, and 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 whether the, you know what kind of therapy there is for for these kind of tumors. Yeah. So the um, giant cell granulomas of the jaw. Um, we also have. I, I didn't show uh, the picture, but uh, you can have the uh, central giant cell granuloma of the maxilla. So in the upper jaw, in the central region, you can also have this granuloma. Um, if it's small, it doesn't give any problems, but those that become symptomatic grow expansively and they, um, uh, they eat the bone away. Um, um, it's a mass. And there, of course, uh, it, it might be associated with pathological fractures and it might affect the, uh, the quality of life. Um, if it's relatively small, then um, you can remove the tumor surgically uh, by curatage and filling it up with bone ends. Um, but if it's a very large and you don't think you can remove everything, then it, 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 becomes, uh, it becomes problematic uh, and it can affect the quality of life. Sometimes these uh, individuals are treated with products that uh, inhibit the osteoclasts, mm -hmm. like calcitonin or other products. If you can inhibit the um, osteoclasts, these are the multinuclear giant cells, or in fact osteoclasts, they are stimulated by the aberrant stromal cells that, and it's or the stromal cells that have the second hit. And if you can um, uh, contain the activity or reduce the activity of these giant cells of these osteoclasts, then um, you get again some bone formation. Um, but it, it's not a simple way of, of, of treating. Thank you. Uh, there is another question from uh, Casey Libman. We apologize because uh, he missed uh, the, the initial part of, of the talk, but he was wondering whether there's a, you know, how common the, 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 the gastrointestinal tract uh, tumors, uh, how common are uh, those that cause acute anemia? Yes, yeah, so these are the gastrointestinal stromal tumors. And um, we, from, from the study of Patrick Combe-Mal in, in, in France and from our study, uh, which are more cross-sectional studies in, in adults, we believe it's uh, in a cross-sectional study, it's about 4%. Um, but if you follow people over time, uh, the, the risk to ever develop such a tumor before the age of 70 is probably higher and is somewhere between 5 and 10%. So in fact, it is not so rare, but it is not very well known. Now, most of these tumors are asymptomatic, um, but uh, when they grow and they become larger, larger than two centimeters, you can have two problems. They can cause acute uh, blood loss, so acute hemorrhage, but it can also uh, metastasize. So we have in our series one individual who was detected um, without any symptoms, but incidentally by a uh, whole body MRI. And uh, afterwards, after removal of the tumor, it turned out a couple of years later that she already had a metastasis in the liver, which was then treated um, afterwards. Um, so they're not very malignant. And in general, the prognosis is much better than isolated gastrointestinal stromal tumors in non-NF1 individuals. So for the same size of tumor, for the same cellularity, the same number of mitosis, so for the same situation, the prognosis is better if you have it as an NF1 individual than uh, when you have it in a uh, non-NF1 individual. What we frequently see in NF1 individuals is that they have multiple of these tumors and it's not necessary to remove all of them, but only those that are two centimeters or bigger. Thank you. Um, I actually have another question myself, which is rather strange, but still I'm going to do it. Um, um, I wondered if, if it's ever happened to you to actually make an NF1 diagnosis after a finding of one of these rare tumors. 
that a patient a patient presents with a very one of these rare tumors ah yes sometimes it's it's because of the gastrointestinal bleeding that we uh, come uh, to a diagnosis um but, but most of the time their nf1 was known because most of these things happen in in adults Mm -hmm. uh, I have not been dealing with the juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia because this is not a tumor, this is a leukemia. And also in children, you have a slightly increased risk of developing a rhabdomyosarcoma. But then in these young children, when these um, leukemias or um, solid tumors develop, uh, they might not have had yet the diagnosis of neurofibromatosis type 1. And there, of course, you more frequently are confronted with the, with the fact that due to a tumor, uh, the diagnosis of NF1 is made. But um, that's, in my experience, relatively um, rare and exceptional in adults with NF1. Thank you. Um, I see no other questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box. And our time is almost up. Um, so uh, I wondered if you, if you if if there was anything from the conversations that we've had that you'd like to point out to the audience, any any new thing? No. Before, well, I I thank you uh, very much, Legis, on behalf of uh, of all the patients for this uh, for this lecture, and and the audience for their very lively. Um, uh, participation. Um, this uh, this masterclass is now over. Uh, we have two more programs already and lined up uh, in November and and December, and we're in the process of defining new dates for the new year. So do continue to check our website, and you will be notified by email if you're on your on our lists. And uh, I wish everyone um, a very nice evening. Goodbye. All right.